All right, I think we're running a few minutes behind, so let's get started. Um, we have, I think, four talks in the lightning session. We added a uh, one towards the end, uh, so there will be four. And Eric Gustafson will be giving the first one. So, uh, Eric, why don't you take it away? Can you hear us, Eric? Yes, I can. Thank you so much. Okay, so I'm going to be discussing uh, a cuted algorithm for simulating lattice gauge theories. So, uh, specifically using a formulation of discrete groups. So, we can take a step back and look at high energy physics and the things we have built around it. Let us understand many aspects of the universe from particle scattering and the small stuff to star mergers to colossally huge stuff about the galaxy. And much of this needs fun computing because it's not classically simulable due to a sign problem and so forth. So let's focus now on lattice field theory. This is a tool that we have for high energy physics that lets us non-perturbatively solve it. And so what we have to do is we take our continuous theory right here, and then we break up space in such a way that our fields live on either links or sites on this four-dimensional checkerboard. And so some of the big physical groups that we care about are U1 for uh, photons, SU2 governing the electroweak sector, and then SU3 for gluon. We also care about how, being able to simulate fermions. And so uh, one way to approximate these uh, continuous groups, such as U1, SU2, and SU3, is by discretizing them. So U1 can be broken up into these cyclic groups uh, or, or clock, clock models. SU2 can be broken up into binary polyhedral groups. And SU3 has similar decompositions into higher dimensional representations. But this has a long history of research and is still an active area of study. And it has a very natural representation on a quantum computer, where each of these each of these different gate each of these different group states corresponds to a different state in your qubit set, or in your quantum system. So what we can do is map the generators for these groups onto a qubit instead of just trying to break up something that may not nicely split up onto two to the n states. And so for z n, what we could do is map each state from zero, one, two, three, and so forth onto different states in our system, or different states. So our orientation up like this could be zero. And then if we're looking at a Z8, Z8, this would be two, and then this would be three, and you can get the picture. Similarly, if we have something more complicated like a non-abelian group such as D4, uh, we can map we can split these generators up. So we have a generator for or qubit corresponding to states on one generator and qubits corresponding to a power of another generator. And so for an example, we could have the first, the first qubit correspond to whether we flip this, flip the, there's been a flip applied for, to our state or in the second qubit corresponds to what rotation we're at around this circle. And now these extensions can be mapped to higher dimensional groups, but I don't want to take, I only have 10 minutes, so I can't really go into a whole host more detail. So now that we have a way to map these groups to qubits, what we can now we need is need to figure out how do we implement these four gates for a pure gauge theory. So we get fermions for a moment, just your gluons, your photons, whatever. We need to be able to, an operator that can give us the exponential of the trace of the group. We need to be able to multiply two group elements together. We need to be able to invert group elements. And these all take part for our magnetic field term in the Kogut-Susskind-Hamiltonian. And we need to be able to Fourier, 
do a Fourier transform of a group element, and that would correspond to electric field operations. So when we break our group register into qubits for each generator, we have we need to have two sets of operations. One is a two-level unitary or some single qubit operations that when combined with a two qubit operation will give us the give us a universal gate set. And so one is just these arbitrary two qubit rotation, one qubit rotations, and then this controlled sum gate that just shifts states depending on what the target shifts the target state by some amount depending on what the control state was. So if we look at Zn for an example, we can break this down into one uh, one Q, uh, one Q for the gate register, and then our inverse is just a set of one cubic gate operations that end up being Clifford like. The multiplication ends up being uh, this controlled sum gate. It's not, this isn't too much different than many representations of U1 already. So if we look at a comparison here, I've taken the results from uh, this from this paper here in terms of a fault tolerant perspective on what gate costs would be. But we can see that C -not, the C naughts for a qubit encoding scale logarithmically, but the, C, the entangling gate operations for qubits are constant with dimension of Hilbert space, which is really encouraging for a NISC era algorithm that we don't have this increase in gate cost. Uh, similarly, if we look at multiple, the multiplication operations, we can see that the number of powerful gates per qubits scales logarithmically, but we don't need powerful gates at all. All we need is that C sum uh, to do a multiplication operation. And we just need four of them to do that group operation, which is quite encouraging. Similarly, if we break, if we go to D4, we can break up our circuits as such, where we just need, where we can break them up into these single qubit operations that are just shifts and Hadamard transforms on two different states for the inverse, or uh, multiplication operations, which just involve Hadamard's X gates and controlled uh, and uh, controlled sum operations. So when we compare the, uh, the costs, and what I've broken down is into one qubit gates is the blue and green, one qubit gates are the blue and green, and then entangling gates are the yellow and orange, that qubits are gonna take more gate operations, end of sentence, than uh, the qubit operation will. And this suggests that maybe encoding through this manner might be more illuminating for a NISC era simulation. So what can we take away? These qubit decompositions reduce gate costs for two groups I've looked at, but it's still, and I'm still actively looking on how to extend this to other groups as well. Decomposing the generators onto these qubits, then once we've broken down our system into smaller, smaller chunks, then if we say we never get a fault tolerant qubit or even some fully scaled NISC, good NISC qubit, we can break it down into a qubit, into a much, our qubit operations that may be leverageable in a fault tolerant era as well. So thank you. Questions? How big of a Q dip do you need for an interesting problem? You know, how big does N have to be for, for um, things to be interesting? So that, that, that would end up being group by group dependent, but even, even having a Q trit could, Q trit or uh it or a Q pet like. Even even that level would be useful. Um, there, and there's nothing to say you couldn't just map. Oh, go ahead. Nobody said anything. Keep keep going. Oh, there's nothing, and there's nothing to stop you from mapping your entire 
group register to a single QDIT other than how well you control that QDIT. So, so these plots where you had Q dits and Q bits, what was the D for the Q dits then there? Uh, so for this one here, the Q, I skip the qubits are kept, the Q dits are scaled to the register side. The, um, so if I'm doing Z16, I have a 16 bit, which this, this isn't, this shouldn't be too surprising, but that, it's a constant scaling given that. But it's still encouraging that breaking up our system like such can reduce gate costs. Yeah. This could be a little tangential, but um, uh, is there like a known discretization that's uh, good enough to actually approximate um, uh, a group. Um, like it, it can get better, you know, um, when you have a plot model that has uh, four states or more, um, the perturbation is just dangerously relevant or is it an XY model. So in some sense, you can get the, the actual XY critical point without having true continuous tree of freedom. Um, I, I was wondering if there's something similar here. Uh, so that is an active area of study. Hank, uh, who I believe is in the room right now, could talk your ear off about it. Um, but for U1, as you crank up N, it obviously gets closer to, ZN gets closer to U1, but to, after Z, ZN equal, after N equal five, that's when you start getting more U1 behavior, such as a Coulomb phase. And, you know, you could probably be okay with Z16, maybe. I, but don't, you know, don't hold my feet to the fire on that one. Um, I don't remember for the SU2 subgroups uh, at what point you uh, reach a scaling regime where it, it can, in certain coupling, regimes, it can approximate the continuous group. Uh, but I know that the binary icosahedral group works, which was one I very briefly showed. Um, and I don't believe any with a naive Kogut, Susskind, Hamiltonian can approximate U, uh, SU3. Thanks. Did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. And we're running a little behind, so let's leave it there. Thanks again, Eric. Thank you so much. Uh, Holmes is next.